So a big thank you for joining us, considering we're living through these difficult times of the pandemic. Since its launch in 2007, the Hamlin Symposium has really grown significantly. I remember our first meeting uh, would have been about 40, 50 people. We have now nearly 650 delegates uh, attending our last meeting in 2019. It's been a great success. It's made through the generous contribution and support of the Helen Hamlin Trust and also Lady Hamlin personally, without which the symposium wouldn't have existed. Uh, sadly, following the enforced cancellation we had last year and the ongoing impact of the global pandemic, we've decided to modify the format as the whole, our whole life has gone into Zoom or Teams. So we thought we should run this online throughout April to July. So instead of having one long day or two long days as we did previously, we divided, segmented it into a series of interactive events. And the theme this year is surgery and beyond. In addition to the rise in surgical robots, there's been a rapid increase in the utility of robotics in the, throughout the pandemic. And we've seen some amazing examples of that. And in actual fact, in many ways, it has really changed the mindset on the role of robotics as well, uh, from car assembly lines to the sophisticated surgery, but this utility during the pandemic has been very novel and really opened up the mindset in terms of what else we can use robots in the future. Uh, advances in human-robot interactions, such as improving robot capabilities to feel, touch, and decide, will also determine the robots of tomorrow and will help hospitals stay ahead at the next pandemic. So to kick things off, we are very fortunate to have some outstanding distinguished speakers this year, joining us across the globe uh, with a promise to be fascinating and enrich in enriching sessions. Uh, and I'm gonna mention some of our distinguished speakers. I'm delighted to meet Professor Ron Kikinis, who is with us, who holds the Leonard Holman Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School, and will speak to us on the translation of IGT technology to lower and middle income countries. We also have the privilege to hear from Professor Alison Okamura, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Computer Science at Stanford University, who will discuss feeling through seeing, vision-based forced estimation in robot-assisted surgery. And last but not least, we will be joined by Professor Greg Peters, Chair of the Department of Urology at uh, UT Southern Western Medical Center and the Chief of Pediatric Urology at the Children Medical Center in Dallas, who will speak to us today on pediatric robotic surgery, lessons learned from children. I'll also like to thank, extend my thanks to all of today's speakers for their contribution to the stimulating program. Without further ado, I'm delighted, by the way, to be able to hand over to my new fellow co-director of the Hamlin Center here at Imperial College London, uh, Professor Ferdinando Rodriguez, an amazing man, a very noble man who's really taking the helm of the Hamlin Center uh, at these difficult times and done an amazing job with it. He's going to give us an overview of the upcoming program of the Hamlin Symposium activities over the next three months uh, and to take us through today's proceedings. I'll also want to take this opportunity to thank you all again for your continual support and trust in this meeting, as well as the funders who have generously supported our research across the world. So delighted to see many of you. And again, I'm going to hand over to Ferdinando. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ara. I'm gonna now share my screen, which hopefully everybody can see. Can you confirm that you can see the screen properly? Great. It's been what, a one and a half years, but still quite challenging yeah, to, to make sure all of this works seamless, seamlessly within the digital medium. So thank you, Ara. Thank you for the, the beautiful introduction. And yes, it is an absolute pleasure and privilege to have become the engineering co-director of the center last year, albeit, in a very, very particular year. We all are part of the community of the Hamlin Symposium, yeah, which represents a unique community of clinicians and engineers, which have, you know, which, which we built over 14 years of meeting every June 
apart from last year, you know, back from 2007, every single year. And it is a very, very special community for us to, to utilize, to, 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 to share best practice and to exchange ideas. Now, last year, as, as Ara mentioned, would have been the, the 13th symposium, which we had to cancel at the 11th hour, as it was going to be impossible to run a live event in June. And this year, we wanted to treat the exceptional challenges arising from the pandemic as um, an opportunity to raise above the noise floor of the online delivery methods, which I'm sure we all have had <laughs> our fair share of over the past one and a half years. So we envisioned a program this year, a slightly different program that instead of rolling over two and a half days, like we've always done in previous year, um, it spans three months from April to July, coupled with a, a new digital tool and a living online platform to celebrate aspects of our community and share some of the latest achievements in the broad space covered by the symposium. In doing so, we have multiple objectives, and the, the, the prime one is to provide a mechanism for the symposium to engage with the wider research community and industry online, exploring new ways to overcome the natural fatigue that we're all experiencing with this digital medium. And it doesn't get any better as the months go on. We just hope that things are gonna get better sooner rather than later. So the first thing is this um, online platform, which launched, as some of you will have seen through the various mail shots and Twitter feed, um, is a website called uh, thehamletsymposium.org, and it's available on your PC, and of course, is easily accessible through mobile platform. Importantly, is a living platform. It is it is designed from the back, from the bottom up as a mechanism for the community centered around the symposium to engage with this online platform. And it will only thrive if our community does engage. There is an online timeline that is soon uh, to feature on the, on the front page of the website, which will give you an up-to-date uh, snapshot of present and future events, which cover a variety of activities aimed at engaging with different aspects of our community. Uh, key, obviously, um, key element of the symposium has always been an, a, a raster of incredible talks by esteemed colleagues from academia, hospitals, and industry um, from, from all over the world. And this year it will be no different with the one caveat that instead of having them condensed over a two and a half um, day program, they will be spread out uh, once a week or thereabouts or regularly through the months of May, June, and July you will have an up-to-date list of these, uh, these talks, which will be moderated by me and will have an interactive component to engage the audience, uh, again, on, on the website. We'll also have, as in previous year, workshops, but of course, these workshops will be a little bit different. So they'll be more like webinars than they are workshops. And because of the online format, they are not the half day or, or one day programs of previous years, but they're actually shorter. So 90 or 120 minutes in duration. And we are helping those who wish to carry out one of these workshops with professional support that helps you to get the most out of this sort of digital way of interacting with the wider community. If you have a longer program, it can span over multiple days as you will see examples of on the website. Importantly, there's always space for new workshops and new workshop proposals. So you're very much encouraged to use the link on the website to uh, put forward new ideas to engage with, with, the, with the workshop format. Now for, for students uh, and researchers, we also have, of course, our paper submission as in previous years. But previously we had a two page abstract, which would then be peer reviewed and presented at the conference. And then we had a follow on special issue with special, uh, with selected um, uh, examples or selected submissions within our wider conference program. Because of this move to an online three-month program, we decided for this year only to turn the paper submission process into a one-step uh, submission where we're using TMRB, our chosen um, journal for the special sections of transactional medical robotics and bionics to, to, uh, to enable the submission of either four-page short paper or full-length journal papers which will then be peer reviewed with the support of our esteemed PC um, as, 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 as has always happened in previous years. Points of note as that are that the call for papers will launch on the 1st of May 
And by the 15th of May, we're hoping that authors in, uh, interested in submitted uh, a, a publication for consideration in the special section, email us to let us know that a paper is to be expected so that by the 30th of June, we can then close to submission and begin the peer review process with aim to um, have the section uh, published on the November, uh, the November uh, section of the, of the journal. Also for students and younger researchers, we, we, we wanted to sort of provide a more colorful way of interacting with the program through online poster competition. So we've already launched this as, um, as an invitation for our researchers across the world to submit posters, which have uh, templates provided by, by, by the symposium uh, organizing team, which we're hoping then to collect and, and, and um, um, broadly showcase on the website and then eventually uh, enter into a competition where a panel will judge the contents, not only on the technical rigor of it, but of course, because it is a poster, it is also on the visual uh, and stylistic style of, of the posters, right? So I would say the paper submission is for the, for the rigorous technical methodological um, uh, content and the poster and the, uh, medical robot image competition are there are, as, as a, are a complement to, to the paper in order to provide uh, creative new content that you can uh, interact with via the website. Again, for the, for the pictures, there is no particular constraint uh, as long as it is broadly applicable to the main domain areas of the symposium and it is visually appealing, different, unique, quirky, or whatever you can think. Now, um, not surprisingly, we have for many years in collaboration with uh, UKRAS um, uh, run the Surgical Robot Challenge, and this year will be no different, apart from the fact that we will not have a physical demonstration of the shortlisted finalists during the actual symposium day. But again, if you have a surgical robotic technology and you wish to compete for this award, which has a pot price or a, a, a price of 15,000 pounds in total, divided into three different categories, which are applications, innovation, and design. Please do submit your two minute video by the closing deadline for this, which is the 31st of May. Now, coupled with the Surgical Robot Challenge, which is the most, uh, uh, the, the most established of the challenges associated to the Hamlin Symposium, we will also run, due to popular demand, a second near identical in, in format challenge, which is the Medical Robotics for Contagious Diseases Challenge. Now, this was obviously launched last year to replace the Surgical Robot Challenge because of the particular difficulties that uh, the world experienced as a, as a result of the pandemic. And because we were absolutely flabbergasted by the quality and breadth and, and, and geographical uh, 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 region of provenance of the, of the entries last year, we decided to run it again. And thanks to our industry sponsors, we will be able to run this parallel challenge, challenge which is specifically designed to, to acknowledge and promote technologies which have been or could be in the future instrumental to the management of contagious diseases in the context, for example, of pandemics. Now for, for um, research groups and uh, principal investigators, we also wanted to provide the website with a mechanism for us to be able to showcase some of the best work that has happened across the world, East, Center, and West, yeah, in the broad context of the Hamlin Symposium. And so there has been a first call to, for, for, for um, showcase pieces that has been launched earlier last month, and we will have another um, reminder coming out by our various channels soon. But the point here, we are, we are strongly encouraging academics and research groups and industry to, to, to provide us with engaging material that basically showcases some of their latest work, either videos or pictures or, or references to publications, which we can then use to populate this aspect of the website. Now, clearly, this website will become incredibly useful and a great place for researchers within this field to go to if it's well populated. And so it is absolutely vital for the broader community to engage with this process. And this also um, uh, um, applies to our unique set of industry partners. Some 
who have companies or who have technologies and, and uh, platforms which they would like to advertise to our community, but others like KUKA and Intuitive who have been great supporters of the symposium for many, many years, in fact, from, from its, its inception. And so there is a particular um, section of the, of the website dedicated to cultivating these industrial relationships for the benefit of, of our community. So altogether, as I said, uh, uh, a roster of activities to join, uh, to, 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 to engage with all aspects of our community from younger researchers to establishing academic PIs and an industry, which will roll out starting today, all the way until the closing uh, ceremony, which is on the 29th of July. Uh, as a summary, these are all the ways in which you can engage with the, with the symposium. And I, and I genuinely hope that having done the work, um, you, you, uh, we will have um, a great take up from our main community, which basically is students and researchers, research groups, and industry. Now, I cannot but thank all of our uh, sponsors and supporters that have made this particular um, venture possible because, of course, it has been months in the making and it's thanks to our esteemed um, academic and, and, and industry supporters. Clearly, far and foremost, the Wellcome Trust and the, and the Helen Hamlin Trust, who really support the day-to-day -day activities of the Hamlin Center. And of course, all of the industry which is supporting and continues to support different aspects of this program. And that's it. If you have any questions about any aspect of the symposium, we have the puppet master behind the scene, who's Maria Knight. She's the director of operation, and you will have seen her name uh, on many of the on much of the correspondence that are come your way through many of our um, online engagement channels. But of course, I am also available, and so is everybody else here. So, without without further ado, we move on to you know the 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 pearl aspect of, of, of our opening ceremony, thanks to the, to, to the contribution of three esteemed guests who are going to share some of their latest work in the area of healthcare technology, followed by a short Q&A, which you, you as the audience can engage with through the little, button, um, the little button at the bottom of your Zoom window. So to start with, I'd like to introduce Professor Ron Kikinis. He, as our uh, already mentioned, is Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School and the Vice Chair of Biomedical Informatics Research in the Department of Radiology at Birmingham uh, Women's Hospital. He has an absolute plethora of accolades. It would basically take us the hour to go through it, it to, to go through them in detail, including prices and esteemed appointments. But we all know him as the father of 3D Slicer, which is likely the most widely used open source software platform for medical image processing. I'm absolutely delighted to hear him speak. I thank him for taking the time to do so and invite him to present his, um, his talk, which is on translation of IGT technologies to low and middle income countries, which is a topic that is of particular importance to us and ARA's Institute of Global Health Innovation. Thank you very much, Ron. And when you're ready, you're very welcome to share your screen. Excellent. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, um very kind uh, introduction. If you stop sharing your screen, I can try to share my screen. I think you should be able to share it straight away, but if you can't, I will stop. Let me just check. Let me see. Let's see how far we get. Yeah. So, okay. So now we are past the technical problems. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to tell you about the project that uh, started uh, like many other projects over the year. Uh, during Mikai 2015 uh, in uh, Munich, where I was talking with uh, my friend and colleague Juan Ruiz Alzola, who is a professor of computer science at, um, uh, in the Canary Islands. And uh, we talked about the fact that uh, our technology hasn't really found a lot of usage outside of uh, uh, US, EU, and uh, China. And so uh, we decided to look what we can do about it. So this is this uh, presentation that I have now. I would like to 
begin by acknowledging uh, my mentor and uh, friend French, Frank uh, Jolès, uh, who uh, died an untimely death in 2014, uh, but is really uh, the father of MR guided interventions in general and has been done a lot to further the entire field of image guidance. Um, I found it a little bit, uh, and now, let's see, yeah. I found it a little bit uh, challenging because I'm used to give uh, this type of lectures in half an hour to an hour and to compress it down to uh, 10 minutes was for me a new experience. I mean, it's different from the conventional talks at, present at uh, meetings where you present one particular project in, in 10 minutes. And so I actually had to invest quite a lot of effort uh, uh, to get this uh, 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 presentation together. And I hope I will not run too much over time. So after an introduction, I'll give two examples of our activities and uh, talk about uh, the need for training uh, uh, before ending my presentation. The context uh, of this activity is embedded in uh, the goals of sustainable development as defined by the UN. And, uh, what we are doing fits into several categories, as you see here. When we go to uh, this type of countries, and specifically, I'll, I'll show you examples from Mauritania and Senegal, which are two um, low and middle income countries in Western Africa. Uh, we find that the boundary conditions are significantly different from boundary conditions that you find in, uh, uh, let's say, the EU or uh, in the US. And uh, electric supplies, telecommunications, both are often unstable and only available in the capital and a few selected other places. Uh, the uh, supply chain is uh, not working to the same level of efficiency that we are used to in our environments. And that uh, poses uh, a lot of challenges. And so specifically for image guided therapy, um, the challenges are to deploy the technology, to use the technology, and that means training people and to have the capabilities to maintain equipment in, under this uh, rather challenging um, uh, uh, circumstances. What you need if you want to, to do this type of work, you cannot do it remotely. You have to do it local. And so having skilled collaborators is an absolutely necessary feature if you want to do this work. And building trust between uh, uh, the collaborators and you teams is again something uh, that is not, it's easy to talk about it, it's not easy to achieve. And it took us uh, a lot of time to find the right people and build the contacts and uh, build interactions. So in a certain way, it's similar to any collaboration, but the circumstances are more challenging. And often you end up doing things that have impact, not just on your collaborator, but uh, potentially a wider impact. And that means that you have to interact with the local system, the political system, and uh, how things are going. And uh, so that's basically the, the framework uh, that uh, has evolved when we started exploring. 
So I'll now talk to you about two examples where we went uh, beyond talking and are beginning to, uh, to do hands-on work. The first one is a project by Alex Golby, who will be one of the presenters later uh, in this uh, uh, symposium about uh, bringing neural navigation to Mauritania. Uh, the second example is about ultrasound guided nephrostomy in Senegal. These two countries are adjacent uh, to each other, but they have uh, very different uh, environments. Uh, uh, Mauritania is in the Sahel zone. It's an Islamic state. Um, it's very poor country. A, a large portion of the population lives in the capital and the large portions of the country are essentially desert. Um, the medical school in the capital, which is called uh, Nuakchot, um, is uh, about 10 years old and many of the doctors practicing in Mauritania were trained elsewhere because there was no uh, medical school available. Um, neurosurgery is uh, an unmet need. There are some neurosurgeons in Nuakchot. Uh, uh, they are, again, trained elsewhere, like in France. So they have been exposed to uh, complex technologies, but those technologies are not available. Uh, in uh, uh, Nuakcha today. And so Alex uh, set out to first uh, understand what the needs are and then basically work on defining a new navigation system uh, that we hope to deploy down the road uh, in, in Mauritania. And so you have to have a minimum set of things that you require, such as um, rigid head fixation, uh, the accessories for the navigation system, and the software. And as you have heard, I'm partial to 3D Slicer. And so a version of 3D Slicer will play a role in this uh, particular endeavor. The second example, and again, I, I have to go very quickly because I have only 10 minutes, uh, is uh, uh, basically um, a, a percutaneous nephrostomy. Uh, and that's a project that we are working on with urologists uh, in uh, Senegal. And, and so, um, there, the goal is uh, uh, to actually not just work in the capital, in the central hospitals, but to eventually migrate some of the uh, technology uh, to external hospitals outside the capital. And we are working there very closely with the military medical service which provides services outside of the capital and uh, which provides the services, not just to the military, but over 95% of uh, their patients are actually civilians without any connection of the military. So the government essentially is using the military to deploy medical services outside of the capital. And what you see here is a first generation prototype that my collaborator Gabor Fichtinger and his group uh, at Queen's University in Canada have uh, designed with uh, a particular focus. And again, let me stress, this is at this point a prototype. What we will deploy will be more evolved, but uh, I just uh, wanted to show you what can be done. So you have a, a regular ultrasound machine, a 3D printed needle guide, and the needle guide basically provides these lines on the overlay after proper calibration, 
And so now we can see the ultrasound image of the needle in the phantom on the left. Um, and again, the point there was to explore, can we get away with very few consumables and can we get away without having to rely uh, on sterilization in places where we don't know whether the sterilization will be, will be done properly because of the available facilities. Um, and of course, uh, one key element there is a 3D slicer. Another key element uh, is the fact that ultrasound basically has gone through a quantum leap. If you go back uh, five years, uh, you had to shell out $100,000 or something like this to get a cart mounted system. Um, today, you have these handheld uh, systems uh, that work with your uh, iPhone and uh, go for a few thousand dollars, but have similar quality of uh, images and similar capability, uh, including imaging beyond just simple uh, structural imaging. And that opens the door to this type of project. Uh, so one other key element is, so you're introducing technology into these environments. And some of the personnel that you're interacting with, with and your medical collaborators have been trained in Europe or uh, in other places. So have uh, been exposed to this type of technologies. But then there are a lot of uh, personnel and the uh, nursing staff and so on that have not. And so training is a very important element if you want to be successful in this uh, type of endeavor. And that is where the Canary Islands come into the picture. Uh, they are a Spanish province. They are essentially at the level that you expect uh, in terms of technology and the infrastructure anywhere in the EU. But they are geographically look very close to Western Africa. Uh, I think within a two hour flight, you can reach uh, African populations around 500 million. So they are an ideal logistic center uh, uh, for uh, doing activities that affect more than one country. And so we have leveraged this situation and the local university, the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, uh, to develop training programs. Uh, uh, so we have one that we call Train the Trainers, where we are providing specialized training uh, for uh, professors in those countries who then go on uh, to uh, build up activities in the countries. So um, here, just as an example, a simulation center uh, in uh, Las Palmas. Here's some technical training during an event uh, that we organized the uh, NAMIC Project Week. And within a few years, uh, we had a working uh, simulation and training center in Mauritania based on the people that uh, were trained uh, in Las Palmas to do this type of work. This center is right now being used uh, uh, in the uh, education of medical students and uh, in the training. So, what I tried to do, and it's very compressed, and I apologize for this, but basically show you that with a little bit of rethinking, we can take some of the technologies that we are using in our research and in clinical practice and make them available in countries such as Mauritania and Senegal. 
And with that, uh, I would like to thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, and absolutely wonderful presentation. There are questions from the audience already, but if we could please continue to populate the Q&A box while, while I introduce our remaining um, guest speakers, and then we'll take all the questions at the end. So it is an absolute pleasure for me to introduce our next esteemed speech speaker. Her name is Professor Alison Okamura. She is at JHU. Uh, sorry, she was and started her career at GHU and is now at Stanford University. She has genuinely produced some of the most highly cited work in our sector from needle steering and haptics in surgery to soft robotics and control. And in fact, I could not but cite her work at every stage of my own career. So it is an absolute privilege for me to introduce her and her talk, which is entitled Feeling Through, Sen through Seeing Vision-Based Force Estimation in Robot-Assisted Surgery. Alison, I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, my, my strategy to get through this 10 minutes will be to talk pretty fast. <laughs> so I won't be pausing much, but please uh, give questions and, and hopefully I can answer them in the Q&A. So um, this talk is going to review some fairly recent work we've been doing, thinking about feeling through seeing. Uh, we want to be able to estimate forces during robot-assisted surgery using vision. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that most of this work was done by my PhD student, Zhang He Chao Chua, and collaborators Ilana Niski and Tony Jark. So the goal here is that we know when you perform robot-assisted surgery that estimating and modulating forces when applied to the environment are important skills. But obviously, hundreds of thousands of surgeries are, are done successfully every year with robots like the Da Vinci Surgical System, uh, despite the fact that there's not a significant level of haptic feedback. And as Ferdinando referred to, I've spent much of my career trying to provide this kind of haptic feedback, but um, I'm the first one to admit that we're not really sure that it's necessary. And one of the reasons for this is because we can estimate forces through other senses. And we'd like to do this for a couple of purposes. One is to improve human performance, uh, understand how people estimate force from vision so that we can provide better training or use that information in a live surgery to provide haptic feedback. Uh, but it also could be a, a guide towards enabling robots to do autonomous procedures. And of course, evaluation of human performance can also overlap both of those. So this talk is going to have two parts. I'm going to try to stuff sort of two, two papers into one talk. The first one being about understanding and developing forced estimation in surgeons or in humans. And uh, this comes from the motivation, like I mentioned, that people are obviously able to do surgical procedures without having haptic feedback. And one of our surgeon collaborators uh, mused a couple of years ago that they want to know how, how is it that humans are, are having this synergy of visual and cognitive experience in order to estimate and estimate forces and improve learning curves. So we take an approach that's um, sort of scientifically based on Bayesian estimation and the idea that people integrate different types of information, including vision and proprioception, and normally direct tactile information in order to estimate, make good estimates of the properties of the world around us. And we think that that's what people are doing during surgery, using a lot of prior learned information about how things feel and how that corresponds to how things look. Um, so we have all of these different uh, features of robot assisted surgery versus laparoscopic surgery versus open surgery. And, and we're going to hone in on this corner here where we're wondering whether haptic experience, for example, in laparoscopic and open surgery helps translate um, the ability to do robot assisted surgery with no direct haptic feedback, but using visual estimates. So briefly, we looked at a couple of different types of very simple tasks. Um, we're keeping the task simple so that we can uh, use these Bayesian estimation theories. Um, we would love to translate this to more, more complex surgical tasks soon. But for now, simple tasks like pulling on an artificial tissue. And what you might notice in this, uh, the middle lower video, 
um, the left lower video is that we also have a slight color change artificially injected when we pull on this artificial tissue. And that's, for example, to mimic blanching of tissue when you pull on it. And we did the same thing with a kind of palpation task. An idea was that we wanted to see how pe well people learned to use visual estimates of force, uh, both to uh, perform unseen uh, levels of manipulation on the object they practiced on, as well as whether they could translate that uh, to a novel task like the palpation task. Uh, and we did this in various training conditions. So direct manual manipulation, holding a, a surgical instrument and pulling on the material, a teleoperation with haptic feedback, and then teleoperation without haptics. And we're looking at how performance translates. So I won't get into all of the, the details of the experiment, but we had different ways of estimating human force uh, estimation ability. And uh, looking at the results, some, some important notes are that uh, we don't think people really used a stiffness prior, like an understanding of the material properties. Uh, ultimately, we felt like people used a kind of proprioception force heuristic, uh, not really a truly a model of material properties, but if I move my arm this far, this is how much force gets applied. So we, we don't think that, at least in, in our simple setup, people were able to truly create internal models of tissue. Um, however, people could do reasonable amounts of estimations, even with this heuristic, uh, but their estimations became poorer when we were having them apply forces to the environment that were outside the area in which they trained. And so it's sort of like the task dynamics of training did influence force estimation ability, but the models in the subject's brains were not very sophisticated. We also found that subjects would not do great at um, translating what they learned from one task to another task. Uh, and I will note that all of our subjects were naive subjects, not expert surgeons. So we might find something different from someone who's had a lot of experience uh, teleoperating with a, a robot like the Da Vinci. So the main takeaways from this work uh, are that we, we were very interested in this idea um, and we're just sort of scratching the surface on how people learn to understand force from visual cues. And so we may need more complicated medical really relevant tasks to fully understand that. Uh, and in, in using these uh, more appropriate scalings and tasks, we might be able to develop training that gives people useful haptic experience. So the second topic, which I'll, I'll breeze through, is force estimation through machine perception. So we looked at how humans might estimate forces, but now we want to know if machines can do it. And so again, here we're looking at how could a machine use visual correlates of force and robot state to estimate force. And we are not the only ones to do this. Um, just here's a tossing up a few references of other people who are interested in doing these kinds of models and forces. And we're asking questions like, how do we improve this um, estimation accuracy? Can we remove the need, need for temporal machine learning networks and instead be able to use prior recorded data? And how does changing the viewpoint or the position or the uh, type of tissue that you're manipulating affect the performance of such an estimator? So we looked at this with three conditions, uh, mainly uh, vision and information about robot state, robot state or, or dynamics only, and then vision only to see what provided the best estimates. And here's an example of our setup, which I'll fly by. And, and this shows the basic result here. So there's a video shown on the left of uh, someone teleoperating a da Vinci research kit in order to manipulate artificial tissue. And then on the right, we have the ground truth, which is an actual force sensor that we put under the artificial tissue uh, showing how much force is applied. It's gonna go and replay this slide so the video shows. Um, and then a bunch of our different estimation methods. And they all do pretty well, actually surprisingly well, we thought, um, except for a method that's only based on the model of robot dynamics. And that's in part because the robot um, dynamics are a little bit complex. It has friction and nonlinearities. And so it's really hard to predict applied force just from that information. But when you use um, some learning on this information, uh, you can do a better job. So they, they all do uh, pretty well, except for physics-based. 
I won't go into all the details here, but the main results here is that vision information really does help, um, and especially it allows us to uh, generalize to unseen tools. So you can see two different tools in the top rows, um, a uh, uh, one type of forceps and then another type, and uh, we're able to actually generalize to different tools, which is nice. Um, however, uh, unseen materials can be a bit of a challenge. And what these videos here are showing is what part of the image the neural network is focusing on to get most of its information. And you can see sometimes it's, it's not really looking at the location that we think is actually important uh, where the tissue is being manipulated by the tool. So overall, the best performance we get is state and vision together. Um, and so we think that they can interact to provide even better estimates if we figure out how to better create our neural networks. And uh, we may have potential issues though with, with overfitting and, and we may need to try different scenarios uh, in order to get the best estimate overall. So big takeaways here are that uh, we can do single time frame inputs that are kind of offline or therefore relatively fast. Uh, we've done this well, but on a simple data set. You know, this is not yet real surgeries. And uh, we've just started trying this on images like the right, where they're more in vivo environments. Um, and we, we may do this in simulation before we do it in actual procedures. Uh, we need to extend to dual manipulators <laughs> to do that. We need force sensors on the instruments. And we have questions about using force estimates so that we can do real-time haptic feedback. So in the end, we like to use these kinds of learning techniques, understanding how humans do it and how machines do it so that we can have some synergy between autonomy and human performance. And with that, I will thank my collaborators again and uh, pass it back to Ferdinando. Thank you very much, Alison. Absolutely stellar presentation, thank you. Um, our final esteemed guest is uh, Professor Craig Peters who is Chief of Pediatric Urology and Professor of Urology at the University of TSMC in Dallas. He's a clinician, a scientist, and an innovator with a special interest in robotic-assisted minimally invasive surgery in the young. And he has influenced policy both at home in the US where he works and internationally. He's a uh, prolific writer and has a long-standing supporter and has been a long-standing supporter of the Hamlin Symposium. It is with great pleasure that I introduce his talk, which is entitled Pediatric Robot Surgery, Lessons Learned from Children. Thank you very much, Craig. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to participate, although I truly wish I were uh, in person with you all in London, uh, but maybe next year. What I'd like to do is give some perspective, um, a little less technical than the last two talks, um, but to provide what I think um, I have gleaned from the last 30 years of doing minimally invasive and robotic surgery in children. And fundamentally, it's, it's to guide our future directions by looking back and taking the perspective of the child. Um, and uh, I think this is important and it's provided me with uh, some guideposts for how to proceed uh, as we progress in our development of this. When we first started doing uh, minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery in children, there was some pushback in that most people felt there was no real benefit. Uh, it took extra time. Often I heard the children recover quickly from any incision and my incision of course is smaller than yours. Uh, I'm not sure that that was the child's perspective. Uh, and we have to maintain that perspective as we uh, continue to look at this and develop it further. It's important to recognize that the value is difficult to assess in a quantitative way, but it's still there. And it may be difficult to measure a value, but the parental perceptions, the child's perceptions, and even the surgeons. I mean, it was difficult for me to say that this procedure was less morbid or less complicated um, but when you see a kid two days after a partial nephrectomy looking happy and healthy at home, uh, that's important. And that was a value that we wanted to try to develop, even though there was a certain degree of, uh, of opposition. In my surgical training, I grew up under this sign from Robert Gross, the father of American pediatric surgery, that if an operation is difficult, you're not doing it properly. And my mentor, Hardy Hendren, the Gross professor of surgery at Harvard, would often come into the room when I was doing laparoscopy and ask, 
what nice operation are you making difficult today? And in many ways, he was right. It was challenging. And when the robot and the da Vinci system emerged in 2002, and we had the opportunity to um, start using this in children for the first time, it was a bit of an epiphany. Because this provided a whole new way of offering minimally invasive surgery without some of the limitations of conventional laparoscopy. And, and that's what we um, have run with and, and I think we've had some success with. As I look at it, and as I look at how we made this progress, I, I look back at kids, and, and although this is not my granddaughter, uh, I get to watch her doing this regularly. And if you watch how children play, we can learn some lessons. They focus intently, and they have a progressive capability. Children don't start out knowing how to do things, they learn it. And just the same as we have had to do this in surgery and more recently and more quickly in robotic surgery. Children have an inherent flexibility. They move with uh, the flow of things. They adapt, they change, they don't have dogma. And finally, and probably most importantly, they have an incredible imagination and natural innovation capabilities. And that's what we need to maintain, I think. Progressive capability is fairly straightforward. And it's really the mastery of simple procedures that lays the foundation for a more complex one. And this is how we've developed our robotic capabilities Simple nephrectomies facilitated a pyeloplasty, reconstruction of the kidney. Pyeloplasty facilitates partial nephrectomies, ureteral ureterostomies, reoperative pyeloplasties. Ureteral surgery facilitated mega ureter repairs, continent catheterizable channels, enterocystoplasties. And even if you don't know what these operations are, you get the picture that the basic operations lay the groundwork for more complex ones, just the same as a child can develop their skills through basic play, moving to more advanced manipulations. Just as a simple example, this was a case I did a year ago, a very unusual complex anatomy of a horseshoe kidney with a double system and an obstructed upper segment from an atretic ureter sitting behind all of the renal vessels. This is a very tight place to operate. We didn't really know the anatomy from preoperative imaging, uh, but with the robotic system providing visualization, access, control, and exposure, we were able to define the anatomy, create a reconstructive strategy, and do this all in a little three-year-old girl. And you can see here, um, although the anatomy is, is not immediately apparent because it's so unusual, you can see the detail of visualization and our ability to manipulate the tissues enough to create a successful reconstruction. Done with open surgery, this would have clearly been more difficult. And it's this sort of advantage that has built upon basic procedures that allows us to be uh, progressively more advanced in what we're doing. Here's uh, the operation that Hardy Hendren popularized, Maggie Yurter tailoring, uh, where we've uh, adapted ways to do this with the, the Da Vinci system, where the ureter is tapered, it's reconstructed, and then reimplanted into the bladder in such a way that it drains and doesn't reflux. Uh, not an easy operation, even open. Uh, the robotic system facilitates this and I think makes it less morbid. Similarly, work from Mohan Gandetti at the University of Chicago, where he has developed methods using the robotic system in children to um, reconstruct the bladder and complex bladder pathology and creating catheterizable channels to allow for bladder empty. All of this um, uh, is an example of how we have progressively learned how to do things and become more technically capable uh, in a safe way. Children are inherently flexible. We have to be when we take care of children. My patients range in size from five to 120 kilograms. Beyond that, pediatric disease, both congenital and acquired, can be extremely diverse. We have to be able to adapt to the child. Otherwise, we're not gonna be successful for that child. Robotic procedures were initially designed for adults of similar size and port placement, for example, was proscribed to require four inches of separation. A lot of people still stick to that. That just doesn't work in a five kilogram child. And even in uh, that recognizing that, the individual needs for the same procedures may be quite unique in different kids. So just as a simple example, we've had to be very flexible in our port placement strategies here for kidney reconstruction. They are now placed based on the anatomy of the and size of the child, not by some formula. In very young children or with a large renal pelvis, the lower port is moved inferior and medial, sometimes even to the opposite side of the body based on anatomy. And for pelvic kidneys, which are down uh, much lower, ports have to be placed based on the location and orientation of the surgical focus. We have to be flexible. And this is uh, an essential component 
and you can't stick to some dogma that someone has developed elsewhere. And finally, imagination and innovation, that's creativity. And that's what kids I think are wonderful at. And, and we, try to, we need to try to channel our inner child, if you will, uh, as we approach these kids. And how do we minimize surgical morbidity with our new technologies, yet at the same time assure the highest quality outcomes in these highly variable clinical situations? How do we approach a child with a unique and often incompletely defined anatomy and clinical problem? These are the typical situations in many pediatric subspecialty fields. As one example, a former uh, partner of mine, uh, Dr. Gogoyo, when he was in Dallas, developed a port placement strategy to completely conceal all of the port sites beneath uh, the bikini line. And this was called the Hydes technique. It's been nicely used. And you can see from the picture on the right that you can barely see any of the trocar scars in this child after surgery. We've uh, taken more complex situations and um, trying to integrate uh, imaging uh, intraoperatively. This is a child with a rhabdomyosarcoma of the bladder where we needed to do a partial cystectomy, but used transvaginal ultrasound guidance intraoperatively to determine where the tumor was to limit the amount of um, healthy bladder to remove during this procedure. Uh, not a standard technique, but this is where we adapt to what we need rather than simply following uh, old patterns. And then finally, this is clearly not urological surgery, but when I was in Boston uh, working with the ENT team, we uh, adapted the uh, Da Vinci system for transoral surgery. This was one of the first examples of transoral robotic surgery to correct a laryngeal cleft in an adolescent girl with uh, recurrent aspiration pneumonia. This sort of uh, creativity uh, and an adaptable team is essential. So the lessons I think we've learned from children is that in dealing with children, just as the child grows and develops, variation and change are constant. To successfully deal with the very dynamic and sometimes unpredictable issues in pediatric care, we must be flexible and creative. This has worked well for me in the last 20 years in robotic surgery. In fact, it has been both essential and extremely productive. So really, no matter what your practice, adult, pediatric, whatever specialty, maintaining a creative and flexible mindset in robotic surgery while increasing your capabilities will be both valuable and rewarding to you and particularly to your patients. I think for those of us privileged to be working in this rapidly evolving field of surgery and medicine, it's our obligation to think broadly, creatively, and with an element of boldness. And in this way, I think we're going to do the best service for our patients uh, and their um, uh, illnesses. Thanks very much. I know this was a little quick, but I hope to give you an idea of our perspective and how we've learned from kids in working with them. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Craig. And thank you to all our speakers. That was our keynotes. Um, and I would welcome questions from the audience. There are a few that have trickled through already. So I'm going to start. Um, addressing some of these, and we'll do those uh, for a while longer until we run out of time, as I think we are, well, in fact, we are almost out of time. So the first question is from an anonymous attendee, and it is, how close are we to using artificial intelligence to provide unconscious bias training for surgeons and medical practitioners or, or medical personnel? And that was a question for Ron, who has to answer <laughs> in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult one, yes. Yeah, uh, no, it's actually right now uh, we are not doing AI in this context. That's the short answer. I, I agree. So if you if you were to say, what is the landscape of AI in 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 becoming more than a, a basic solver? Are we talking 10, 50, or 100 years? So before. We're, before we, we give machine learning as AI or artificial intelligence more of a decision-making component to either diagnostics or therapy? Uh, so now we are leaving the topic of my presentation, but of yeah. course I have an opinion. And uh, if you look at the current technology, a lot of it is amazing, but what it is amazingly lacking is robustness. Most of the algorithms that I'm aware of work only in very carefully and narrowly defined boundary conditions. 
And as soon as you violate those, uh, the algorithm goes haywire. And that fundamental limitation, we haven't yet figured out how to overcome. And my personal opinion that is partially driven by the fact that we don't really understand how the algorithms work. Yeah, we take I mostly a black box approach. And so trying to understand when they fail and failure analysis is an extremely important uh, activity in engineering sciences. It's just not there yet. Yeah, I think it's quite telling that the first question is about AI because it is the flavor of the month. But I think, yeah, yeah I tend to agree that yeah, it may be slightly overstated at the moment. We have another question for Ron, which is from someone demanding at Intuitive, and he, and he asks, I'm curious what the regulatory pathways you are needing to consider for some of the intervention uh, initiatives that you <coughs> presented for new navigation and for continuous interventions. Yes. Um, so, I mean, in the initial phase, we are going to do phantoms, so that's not an issue. The initial trials will be in a university setting, which means you can get by with a, a ethical committee application and approval. And both of the counter examples that uh, I mentioned to you have such ethical committees for the university. And so there is a mechanism in place. You go beyond that, you need commercial uh, support. And uh, essentially, the laws in both uh, Mauritania and Senegal are very comparable to the laws in France, which means EU. So you need to have the equivalent uh, to CE certification. That's down the road. But when you want to go beyond the clinical trial in a university hospital, that's the road that we will have to travel. Thank you, Ron. Um, Thomas asks a question to Alison, and it's on the topic of inferring force from vision to help build better heuristics for training. What are your thoughts about having surgical trainees work on simple models to build this uh, thought process? Should this uh, a part of surgical robotic training? Should, should, should this become a part of surgical robotic training? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So uh, I don't think we'll know for sure until we've completed our research in this line of inquiry whether that's um, a good idea. But indeed, we believe that forms of training will better help people develop internal models for the mapping between forces applied and, and what they see and how they move their limbs when they're performing surgery. I think a good analogy for why that would be a good, a good thing to do is because of medical illustrations, right? Instead of just showing people images of surgery, we have very talented medical illustrators in our field who create cartoon-like uh, simplified versions that improve understanding from a visual perspective. And so it makes sense that there could similarly be haptic cartoons on, uh, you know, where we, we train on, on simpler models and help people fundamentally develop skills for mapping between force and vision. And then those could be hopefully translated into more complex, realistic surgical scenarios. Yeah, I agree. Um, the next question is still for Alison and it's um, from Trish here at Imperial, a colleague from Design Engineering. And he asks, how did you verify the accuracy of visual to force map of participants? Did the yeah, participants th self-report their guess of the force? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Thresh. That's appreciated. As I zoomed through our experiment, I didn't describe the details. Uh, yes, yeah, so we looked at several ways of doing this, uh, but ultimately what we had, instead of people just reporting a value of force, we had them pull um, after some training about uh, pulling certain distances and what types of forces would be applied. We had them uh, try to pull in order to, or push if the palpation case, uh, in order to reach a certain desired level of force. So rather than reporting it verbally, we had them act it out and then we measured those forces. Halfway, yeah, but but more quantity for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Um, we've got um, a question for Craig Peters from Leonard, uh, Leonardo from IIT, and he says, Professor Peters, fantastic talk. Pediatrics tends to be tends to be um, sm small market for medical devices, surgical technology companies. Oops. Oh, I think Craig 
it's so efficient he replied to the question typed it and thus is gone but i do i do imagine then that the question that has been answered uh, Leonardo will be able to see the answer to which everybody else can do the same via the Q&A functionality, which gives me the opportunity to ask Craig one question of my own about, about the topic of pediatrics and, or, and robotics. So quite a few of us have dabbled in this whole idea of trying to develop technology that, that works within the bore of an MR scanner because of certain advantages of being able to see things in 3D concurrently online without any ionizing radiation. But it's always been quite difficult because of the cost and complexity and time involved in trying to deploy robotics within an interventional MR suite. And there is, there is some real advantage in, in, in looking at this type of tech in pediatric care, especially because of the you know, added risk of ionizing radiation in children and the additional difficulties, as you mentioned, of working within a very, very, very tight environment. What are your own thoughts about the future of robot, robots that work within an MR scanner? Is it still sort of nice to have, but not really necessary? Or do you, do you really see a value going forward if we, were to able, if we were able to solve some of the underlying challenges that are still remaining? A great question. Uh, and I also see that you have uh, Kevin Cleary, uh, my uh, colleague, um, formerly direct colleague now at a distance uh, speaking in a few weeks um, on that. I think it would be potentially great. The technological challenges are substantial. Um, I would imagine that this is going to be an open um, magnet rather than a bore, um, which is you know, now commercially available. I think the challenges are gonna be, where do we use it? Um, and um, can we get it to be cost effective? It would. It's people have tried doing this in neurosurgery with, where things are a little more fixed. In the abdomen with deformable um, tissues and stuff, it's a little more challenging, yet that's where the need of image guidance, I think, in surgery could be extremely helpful. Uh, my little illustration using an ultrasound guided uh, intervention with the Da Vinci, um, it was with that in mind. It would be wonderful. Um, uh, I think there would be value. There's a lot of technology to develop. Fantastic. Thank you, Craig. It is certainly something that we at Imperial have been doing for a number of years, but it's one of those technology areas where sort of the mirage, yeah, for every hurdle that you overcome, there are many more hurdles along the way before this becomes a little, more, a little bit more widely accepted. I think in the interest of time, and Marianne will tell me whether we should go on or we should bring this meeting to a close, I would like to thank our guests, there are more questions in our Q&A, which, which uh, we will endeavor to answer offline so that we can share it with the audience. And of course, this recording will also be available on the website. As was said multiple times, there will be a, a raster of great talks from, from rather prominent figures within our space. Uh, Alex Colby, um, big one of them, Clary, Kevin Cleary, all coming up in the next couple of months. Please, again, one pledge to engage with the program. This program, although it will never replace the real thing, which we all hope we're going to get back to next year, will only work if the community, as a, uh, the broad community, engages with it. Yeah, it cannot run, at least in this online version, just as a one way street. So please, please, please go to the website and find the different ways in which you can involve, get involved with the program. And we, will look to, we look forward to see you over the next couple of months. Thanks again to our sponsors. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to the audience. And I will see all of you soon. Thank you.